organizer for the Communist Party and president of the San Luis Workers Education Society. And with us this evening, we have Dr. Gerald Horn, uh, a foremost uh, scholar on African American history, um, who has published uh, well over 30 books, if I'm not mistaken, and uh, has another three books uh, to be published next year. Um, and so without any further ado, uh, thank you, Gerald Horn, for joining us this evening. Uh, please uh, go ahead and start with your introduction, and then we'll get into some of the questions. Well, thank you, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, our focus this evening is on the volume edited by the late historian Philip Foner on the impact of the Bolshevik Revolution, 1917, in the United States of America. Now, the Bolshevik Revolution was one of those rare world historic events. Uh, you may know that in my introduction to the recently published volume put out by international publishers, I compare it in terms of impact to the Haitian Revolution, 1791 to 1804. Because just as the Haitian Revolution, 1791 to 1804, ignited a general crisis of the entire slave system in the Americas that could only be resolved with its collapse, which it did not only in the Caribbean, in Jamaica, Barbados, Trinidad, circa 1833, 1834, and then the United States itself, circa 1863 to 1865, I think it's fair to say that the Bolshevik Revolution ignited a general crisis of the system of capitalism and imperialism as it existed at that particular juncture. Now, the Bolshevik Revolution emerges from the turmoil of World War I. Uh, you may recall World War I, 1914 to 1918, the United States not entering into the latter stages, the spring of 1918, quite frankly. And interestingly enough, there's this thesis that what helps to draw the United States into World War I is the so-called February Revolution, 1918, in Russia, uh, where the so-called Kerensky forces, you may recall, uh, seem to have hegemony, but the writing was already on the wall. And the United States then enters, but of course is thwarted as the Bolsheviks come to power. But nonetheless, you may recall that for a number of years after that, the United States and its allies conducted an intervention in Russia and Central Asia to try to, as the saying went at the time, strangle the baby in its cradle. Uh, they did not succeed, as you well know. Uh, I would say, from my point of view, a central and major impact of the Bolshevik Revolution was its impact on the system of colonialism. That's why I used the phrase how it helped to ignite a crisis in the capitalist imperialist system as it existed at that time. I mean, for example, right now I'm writing a book on Southern Africa. And there is no doubt that the folks in Angola and in Mozambique and South Africa itself would not have succeeded but for the assistance of Moscow, not only militarily, not only in terms of training military guerrillas and providing uh, training in terms of intelligence and providing material support, giving scholarship to students, etc. Uh, it was the decisive reason that Southern Africa was liberated. But likewise, I would say with regard to the United States of America, I don't think you can begin to understand the agonizing retreat of the more horrible aspects of Jim Crow without understanding the existence of the socialist camp and how Washington found it difficult to compete for hearts and minds in an Africa and a Caribbean that were rapidly decolonizing as long as people of color, and black people in particular, were being treated so horrifically here, and that helps to create a dynamic that leads to this retreat from Jim Crow. And likewise, if you want to understand some of the difficulties that are taking place in the world today, I guess the most recent bit of evidence is the election in Germany, where the so-called alternative for Deutschland, which is widely perceived as a neo-Nazi party, 
is going to be represented in, in the Bundestag, the German parliament, uh, for the first time in 70 odd years, I don't think you can understand that epical development without understanding the erosion, shall we say, of socialism in Eastern Europe, more specifically in Eastern Germany, but also in the Soviet Union, and how that helped to empower the right wing, something that I'm sure you in the United States are well familiar with, but it also had an impact across the Atlantic. So let's see now. I'll stop there, and I think, Tony, you have some questions for me? Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Horn. Um, first, in terms of the questions, uh, some of our participants tonight may not be familiar with Philip Boner or with the Cold War context in which this particular book was written. So before we get into the actual content of Boner's The Bolshevik Revolution, uh, Dr. Horn, do you mind commenting a little bit on Boner's life, who he was, and why a new centennial edition of this book is being published now? Well, Philip S. Foner was probably the preeminent Marxist U.S. historian of the 20th century. I guess his only competition would be Herbert Aptheker, the late Herbert Aptheker. Of course, Philip Foner has passed from the land of the living as well. Uh, he was of Eastern European Jewish descent. Uh, he was part of a prominent family of scholars and activists. Uh, his uh, brother, Jack, was a historian of black Americans and uh, black soldiers, and Jack's son, Eric Foner, is considered to be a leading historian of the Civil War and Reconstruction. And then, of course, there was Henry Foner, who was a leader, a trade union leader, and Mo Foner, who was also a trade union leader. Uh, Philip Foner was sacked, uh, perhaps illegally, from the City College of New York in Harlem in the early 1940s as part of an anti-communist purge. He wound up teaching at the historically black Lincoln University outside of Philadelphia in Pennsylvania. He taught there for a number of years. The Cold War context is that the hysteria that gripped the United States in the period from, let us say, 1917 to 1991, when the Soviet Union collapses, when the United States turned all of its energy <laughs> to destabilizing uh, the, the Soviet Union uh, spending trillions of dollars on Pentagon spending, uh, even cutting deals with religious zealots in Afghanistan in order to uh, weaken the Soviet Union, which had intervened in Afghanistan in 1979 on behalf of a left-leaning government. As you know, that backfired spectacularly on September 11, 2001, when these alleged former allies then attacked Washington and has ensnared the United States in a war that's continuing to this very day, not to mention spinoff wars that are taking place throughout that region. And perhaps the most spectacular own goal, as they say in London, that the United States was involved in was the deal it cut with China to try to undermine the Soviet Union. Uh, this uh, was seen as a brilliant stroke by Richard M. Nixon some four odd decades ago when he went to China. But I dare say that sooner rather than later, given the fact that China has turned into this juggernaut, that brilliant stroke won't be seen as brilliant sooner rather than later. In any event, that's the Cold War context that gave rise to this book, where Foner was intentionally trying to intervene in the anti-communist discourse, trying to revive and resuscitate a history that had been forgotten, because as the book suggests, uh, surprisingly enough to certain U.S. audiences, there was significant sentiment in favor of the Bolshevik Revolution in its immediate aftermath. And it took uh, a lot of pushing and poisoning by U.S. imperialism to help to alter that positive attitude. You know, one of the things that struck me when reading the, uh, when reading the book was how many unions and how many... Uh, uh, religious people and even some bankers and businessmen uh, praised the uh, emergence of the Soviet Union and saw it as a great uh, step forward for uh, for uh, humankind. Um, were there particular things about the book for you that stand out the most? And um, and also, why is it important for us today to care about what liberals, labor leaders, and radicals thought about the Soviet Union? 
1919 to 1921, and how is that connected to the struggle for what some folks have referred to as scientific socialism? Well, the late writer Gore Vidal once suggested that the USA stands for the United States of Amnesia. There is widespread ignorance about history in this country, and many of our liberal, labor, and radical friends are not even aware of the history of their own ideological tendencies. And so it's very important for this kind of history to be revived, to be brought to their attention, because it may lead to their rethinking some of their fundamental concepts, because as you know, given the strength of trumpery uh, as we speak, the fact that this con man got 63 million votes, that suggests the formidable task that's ahead of us, which also suggests that we cannot do this by ourselves. We'll need liberal friends, allies, labor friends, allies, all manner of friends and allies in order to push back successfully against trumpery. Uh, I guess what struck me about the book, just speaking as a historian, what always strikes me about Philip Foner's books is how he was able to accomplish so much in the era before word processing and the internet. Uh, it, it, it's, it's quite staggering. As a matter of fact, I, I would suggest to the audience just about any book that he published or wrote, because he published or wrote dozens, scores of books, all of which repay attention. He, he wrote a very interesting book on uh, Cuba and the U.S. war in Cuba at the end of the 19th century. He wrote a very interesting book on American, uh, black Americans and socialism. He wrote a very interesting book on women and socialism. I mean, just about any subject under the sun, you can find a Philip S. Foner title. So just the fact of his energy continues to astonish me. Well, not to not to mention the uh, ten volume history of the American labor movement. Oh, right. How, how could I forget? <laughs> um, well, before we open it up for any uh, audience questions, there was one other question I wanted to ask you, and you kind of alluded to it uh, briefly, but uh, just to go into a little bit more detail. Um, You've argued elsewhere that African Americans throughout U.S. history sought allies abroad and that they often attempted to leverage international pressure against the most egregious aspects of Jim Crow. Um, you also note, as you, you briefly outlined earlier in the introduction to Foner's book, that it's hard to understand the importance of the Bolshevik Revolution without also understanding the Haitian Revolution. So. Do you mind also expanding a little bit more on those thoughts and perhaps also give a few examples of what you mean by that, especially African Americans' relationships to the Soviet Union? Oh, sure. I mean, I, I guess the leading evidence of that particular trend is the fact that so many black luminaries were attracted to the ranks of the U.S. Communist Party, which, as you know, was closely tied to the Bolshevik Revolution. I'm speaking of W.E.B. Du Bois, the father of Pan-Africanism, father of the NAACP, uh, who joined the Communist Party in the 1960s, and in his 90s, believe it or not. Uh, William Patterson, who I spoke on before and who I wrote a book about, Ben Davis, uh, Claude Lightfoot, Ishmael Flory, Shirley Graham Du Bois, Claudia Jones, who was a leader not only in black America, but after being deported because of her Trinidadian Roots wound up being a leader in the emerging black British community. Ferdinand Smith uh, of Jamaican origin, who was a top ranking trade unionist in the United States, even I would say exceeding A. Philip Randolph, who's better known, who founded the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters. Uh, Smith founded the National Maritime Union, obviously a more powerful union, who was the number two leader uh, before he was ousted and sent back to Jamaica, where he became a leader of the independence struggle there. But I think that. Those examples uh, point to the attraction that the Bolshevik Revolution had for black Americans because, as I've argued elsewhere, if you look at 1776 and the founding of the United States, uh, this revolt against British rule, which has been ballyhooed, uh, it's no secret <laughs> that 
uh, after the founding of the United States, the slave trade accelerated, uh, slavery was ossified, etc. And it took the Haitian Revolution to shake the foundations of slavery in the United States. And I argue that what 1776 did do was, at least on paper, try to move away from the religious conflict of Europe, Protestant versus Catholic, for example. Uh, and at least on paper, uh, move away from the more egregious aspects of anti-Semitism, for example. But it took the Haitian Revolution to then shake the foundations of slavery, just like the Russian Revolution helped us put on the table the question of class and class struggle, and the question of the working class becoming a class for itself and organizing unions to push back against bosses and for higher wages and better working conditions. And so it was the Russian Revolution that had a similar impact on black Americans in terms of this new state helping to change the discourse from race to class, which then attracts more black Americans who were very much in favor of changing that focus. And once again, as your question suggested, this was nothing new. Um, I'm doing a book on the 17th century that'll be out uh, in January. And as the slave trade accelerates in North America in the 17th century, that is to say the 1600s, you find that the enslaved Africans are trying to ally with Spain against the English-speaking settlers of South Carolina, Virginia, etc. And then after the settlers overthrow British rule in 1776, you, your audience, the audience may know that by several orders of magnitude, the Africans sided with the British, not with the settlers, which helps to account for why black people have been penalized and pulverized so intensely uh, over the decades. And then, of course, the Africans continued to side with the British up to and including the War of 1812, when in August 1814, when Washington, D.C. was sacked, uh, the redcoats were joined by the Africans in Washington, D.C., who sent President James Madison and his garrulous spouse Dolly fleeing into the streets one step ahead of the posse. And then the Africans jumped on British boats and moved in mass to Trinidad and Tobago, where their descendants continued to reside. As a matter of fact, when I was speaking on this subject in New York a few years ago, it turns out that some of the people in the audience were descendants of those black Americans who had fled on British boats uh, 200 years ago. So this whole question of a black American alliance with uh, internationally is one of the more powerful explanatory devices in our history. And I would dare say that one of the problems that black Americans have today is a loss of that particular insight and the difficulty of forging those kinds of alliances that have been so important to our history. Wonderful. Thank, thank you, Gerald. I, if I'm not mistaken, you've noted uh, maybe in your most recent book on Paul Robeson that it was the uh, you know, even even the organization surrounding Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. lacked the international contacts of the communist-led Council on African Affairs as well as the communist-led Civil Rights Congress. Well, that's true. Um, I not only, not only said that in my Robeson book, I think I said it in a couple other books as well. It's It's been one of the major uh, defects of the black liberation movement in recent years and helps to account, in my opinion, in part, in no small measure, for this spectacular rise in police killings that, of course, have rocked your own St. Louis and Dee's own Chicago and virtually every community from the Atlantic to the Pacific. Well, at this point, uh, Dee, do we want to go ahead and open the uh, webinar up to questions from the audience? Okay, thank you, uh, 
Dr. Horn. Thank you, Tony. Now uh, we will open uh, the floor to questions and comments from the audience. All you have to do is click, use your mouse uh, cursor to click the raised hand icon, the raised hand picture, and uh, we'll know that you want to ask a question or uh, make a comment and we can uh, open your mic. Okay. Um, okay, Gary, your mic is open. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I was thinking about this uh, in particular, is that, um, you know, forgetting about now, or going beyond the time of uh, World War One of 1917 of the Bolshevik Revolution, and let's go forward to the time of post-World War II, the independence of the first countries in Africa, and particularly of the role of Kwame Nkrumah, who was probably the first, I don't know, you know, I'm not actually sure of this, but maybe the first African leader to lead that process of African independence. I mean, you know, before, I mean, you have like the inter-imperialist conflicts of the U.S. and Britain and, you know, one side, you know, favoring the people of African heritage over another, but, you know, more or less not for principled reasons, but for, you know, the reasons of, you know, whatever was expedient at the, at the time. Now you have, in 1960 or the early 1960s, the African people themselves, you know, coming forward and saying that, you know, it's time for you to go. You know, now it's our time. So, you know, I'd like, you know, you know, kind of like to tie that time of, you know, world upheaval in 1917 to this other time of setbacks to imperialism of the 1960s. Well, first of all, with regard to 1917, as you probably know, there were these schools set up in the Soviet Union where people came from all over the world, including from black America. William Patterson, for example, to come for political education and training of various sorts. Uh, you may recall that the South African Communist Party is founded in the aftermath of the Bolshevik Revolution, the aftermath of World War I, and they began sending cadre to Soviet Union to be trained. After 1945, of course, that process accelerates. Now, you mentioned Kwame Nkrumah, uh, who leads Ghana, West Africa, to independence in 1957. Uh, he also studied in the United States of America. He studied at uh, Lincoln University outside of Pennsylvania and also at the University of Pennsylvania. The U.S. authorities thought that they had reason to believe that he was a member of the Communist Party. Uh, I, I mentioned that I believe in the recent book I just published on the Associated Negro Press where he plays a prominent role. He also opened the doors of independent Ghana to not only many U.S. communists, including W.B. Du Bois and Shirley Graham Du Bois, uh, but to other independence leaders. And, and th that's the thing about what happens is that there's sort of a virtuous circle created. That is to say, the Bolshevik Revolution triumphs, and then they begin to assist other countries. And then those other countries get independent. They begin to assist other countries. I mean, for example, you can't understand the struggle in the Congo and the coming of independence in the Congo uh, some 60-odd years ago without understanding the role of Kwame Nkrumah's Ghana, uh, for example. So I hope that that's a response to your intelligent question. Uh, and if not, perhaps Dee can follow up. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, OK, Lowell, your mic is open. Lowell Denny, your mic is open. Thank you, Dr. Horn. It's, it's an honor again to uh, be able to ask you a question. I, I need your help in clarifying for, for us, for me, why black Americans in particular, or blacks in the diaspora, were so attracted 
to the Bolshevik Revolution in particular and to the Communist Party um, in general. Um, I asked this question, I think I asked you before in your last class, I have an ongoing thesis that I've seen no reason to dispute yet that while we in the United States are guided in our bourgeois, if you will, history books to look at the 60s as being the radical period of our recent history, I believe it was 1917 and the immediate aftermath that is the radical, the radical period, um, not just for blacks, but for workers, for women, in the sense of women getting the vote. So I want to kind of piggyback on Tony's earlier question. And I'd like you to elaborate what drew black people, the black diaspora, black Americans, to that revolution in Russia in 1917. Thank you. Well, thank you for that question. There, there's so much I could say, so I'll try to be brief. I mean, if I were talking to an anti-communist audience, one of the first things I would mention is, is, is pragmatism on the part of Moscow. That is to say that any nation seeking to confront another nation oftentimes tries to appeal to the disgruntled community within said nation. Uh, and thus, black people are disgruntled, for reasons I'm sure do not have to be detailed. And as a result, Moscow reached out to them just on a pragmatic basis. I have a book coming out in a few months on the relationship between black Americans and Japan, for example. Japan spent a lot of capital metaphorically and otherwise, making appeals to black Americans, uh, bringing them across the Pacific on delegations, et cetera. As a matter of fact, Tony, your neighborhood, St. Louis and East St. Louis was the epicenter of that entire movement. And from black Americans part, and this ties into Moscow as well, one of the reasons that they were responding to Japan was because of 1917, when you had the pogrom against black Americans in East St. Louis, where they were burned at the state, lynched from street lights, et cetera. So they were looking for assistance. And so likewise, you had black Americans who were looking for backup. They're looking for assistance. They're looking for support uh, diplomatically and otherwise. And the same holds true for Africans and people in the Caribbean as well. And then if there's a concept of socialism, I think that that was appealing. Uh, that is to say, to, to eliminate the boss class and to have uh, spending on education and health care, I think that that appeals to the humanitarian in, that exists in most of us. So I think that there are, were many reasons uh, why there was this appeal. And I'll mention one more factor as well. I remember when I first started going to London to do research, I, I was surprised that the, the people who were defined as white over there were not as nasty as these people on this side of the Atlantic. And the, now, of course, if I spoke with a Jamaican accent or a Nigerian accent, of course, I might have had a different reception since accent discrimination is a more potent factor in the UK than it is here. And I think that likewise, many people, when they traveled to the Soviet Union, they were, it's just like Robinson talks about that, you know, you're surprised that you know, people are not nasty. I mean, they're not, they're not, you know, and of course what happens here is a result of this culture that's been created here, this imperialist culture, a slave owning culture, a slave trading culture, the stench of the slave market as Ben Davis Jr. used to call it. And so it's, and it's culturally determined. I mean, it's not genetically determined, obviously. And so I, I think that that's another reason why uh, Moscow was a lodestar for black Americans because as you know, uh, I'm sure you know about the, the writer Pushkin who was of African descent and who was considered the father of the Russian language. And Russia did not have as deep a relationship with the African slave trade as these Western European countries on the United States, to, which is a gross understatement. And it's that particular 
odious commerce that helps to give rise to these backward attitudes. And since Moscow was not deeply involved in that odious commerce, that created favorable conditions to make overtures to black Americans and treat black Americans like human beings, as opposed to treating black Americans like second class citizens, which is the general root in the United States of America. Okay, Jeffrey, your mic is open. Open, Jeffrey McFadden, your mic is open. Hi, Dr. Horn. I want to uh, thank you for uh, for uh, presiding over these seminars. I'm uh, Jeff McFadden from Kentucky. I'm I'm new to this. Uh, I was wondering if you might could speak on the reasons why uh, J. Edgar Hoover, uh, head of the FBI, of course, among others in the federal government were absolutely convinced uh, from the Russian Revolution all the way up to the 1970s that African Americans were uh, perhaps the primary revolutionary vanguard and of course that occasioned the severity of the response or the sabotage of the, as far as they could do so of the civil rights movement and uh, the treatment of Dr. King and the infiltration of civil rights and anti-war groups. I was wondering why uh, if you knew why Hoover fixed on that idea and and uh, his actions were motivated by that for for so very long, why was he so paranoid about African Americans uh, colluding with the with the Soviets as he saw it? Well, I think it's guilty fear uh, on, on the one hand, that is to say that those who engage in a treacherous behavior like the FBI does, they have good reason to believe that the people they're pulverizing may want to retaliate <laughs> and may want to organize against them. And they fear that, uh, understandably and justifiably. And Mr. Hoover uh, certainly was in the vanguard of persecuting black people, and so uh, he had reason to believe that they would want to retaliate. Uh, that's point number one. Uh, point number two is that perhaps Mr. Hoover and the FBI at a rudimentary sense of social science. Uh, that is to say that if you look at the history of the United States of America, it's well known that the anti-slavery vanguard uh, were the victims of slavery. That is to say the people of African descent, the leading abolitionists, those seeking to abolish that hateful, spiteful system, were people of African descent. And perhaps Mr. Hoover had reason to believe that with regard to capitalism and imperialism, that black workers on the bottom rung of society uh, had an incentive and a material basis for opposing that system. And certainly, if he were to scan the membership ranks of the U.S. Communist Party and espy the existence of Ben Davis Jr. and Angelo Herndon and William Patterson, <laughs> and Shirley Graham Du Bois and Claudia Jones, et cetera, he might readily and easily come to the conclusion that black Americans were attracted to socialism. Or, in terms of his persecution of Martin Luther King, uh, one of the reasons why Martin Luther King was a great figure was because he was, shall we say, less anti-communist than many of his peers and counterparts, particularly on the NAACP, after all, it was um, Martin Luther King who hired Jack O'Dell, who's still in the land of the living in self-imposed exile in Vancouver, British Columbia, uh, who, of course, was a member of the National Maritime Union, a communist-led union, uh, who was brought before the House on American Activities Committee and grilled about alleged Communist Party membership uh, after the word was passed by John F. Kennedy in the Rose Garden of the White House to Dr. King because he thought that J. Edgar Hoover might be bugging the Oval Office. So he took King to the Rose Garden to tell him to get rid of Jack O'Dell and supposedly King agreed, but then he had a, a subterranean pipeline to Jack. And so J. Edgar Hoover was well aware of this. And I think that that helps to explain uh, his so-called paranoia with regard to black Americans and communists, but as it oftentimes said about paranoia, uh, even paranoids have real enemies, and certainly J. Edgar Hoover had real enemies in the black community.
Christian, your mic is open. Christian Waters, your mic is open. Uh, uh, good evening, everyone. Um, my main question is really, really is how, how do we convince others in the leftist movement that the removal of private property is the primary goal in a sense for positive change in, in the e economic system? And how could you use, sorry, how could you use the example of Thomas Sarkar and Burkina Faso? Uh, how was he able to do this uh, successfully? Well, thank you. I mean, I think it's a step-by-step -step process. I mean, um, you may know that uh, convincing people to abolish private property in humans was not easy, nor was it simple in, in North America. But it was a step-by-step -step process, and then events accelerated mightily beginning in the 1860s. At some particular historical moments, uh, what seems impossible now seems likely because of change conditions. And so the only thing I can say is to keep plugging away, uh, keep plugging away in terms of struggle in the first place and education accompanied by struggle and keep trying to point out the contradictions of society, keep trying to point out the absurdity and injustice of billionaires existing while the ranks of the homelessness continues to grow and proliferate, of billionaires existing while education tuition continues to rise, I'm sure that what I'm saying is not coming as a revelation, but that's about all I can really add. I don't know, Tony, you have anything to add to that? Not at this point, no. no. Okay, I'd like to invite uh, some of the women uh, who are in the audience to ask questions. Uh, and as we uh, look forward to that, Andrew, your mic is open. Andrew, your mic is open. Uh, and good evening, Dr. Horn. Um, I just wanted to ask if you could briefly touch on uh, the divide in the Socialist Party that took place as a result of the revolution and the role of race and racism in that divide and also where the Wobblies fit in in regards to this matter regarding race and racism? Well, the, Wob the Wobblies, as they were known colloquially, the IWW, it was an anarcho-syndicalist organization. That is to say, it was a group that arises, particularly in the western part of the United States, uh, more than a century ago, uh, particularly amongst lumber workers and timber workers and copper miners in Montana, et cetera. Uh, trying to organize one big union, uh, trying to execute a general strike, oftentimes they disdain the idea of organizing a political party to press in elections and matters of that sort. But as you probably know, the Wobblies came under severe repression and persecution by the U.S. authorities, and one of their paramount leaders, Big Bill Haywood, wound up migrating to the Soviet Union and if I'm not mistaken, uh, died and was buried there. Now, with regard to the split amongst socialists and communists, some of that has to do with World War I and the fact that many who we now would call social democrats, although we, we may not have called them that then, uh, entered the war alongside their bourgeoisie. And of course, that was hotly disputed by many who became communists post-19, or actually in the period leading up to October 1917. Uh, as you also probably know, uh, in the period leading up to the collapse of the Soviet Union, <laughs> uh, I'm afraid to say that some of the fiercest opponents of communists were socialists. I think of Francois Mitterrand, the socialist leader of France, uh, who turned out to be one of Ronald Wilson's Reagan's closest comrades. But 
I would hope that there is an agonizing reappraisal on the part of our socialist and social democratic friends in light of that history. Once again, I turn to the German elections where the social democrats did not do very well. And I would argue that part of the problem that the social democrats are having, not only in Germany, but I would say on a pan-European basis, is that with the weakening of communists, they lost an ally and now are facing an emboldened U.S. ruling elite who is giving them no quarter. And not only that, but the weakening of communist parties upset the political ecosystem in a manner that, is also, that has also been detrimental to socialists as well. I mean, you can see that unfolding in the Labor Party, uh, particularly in the last few decades before the rise of Jeremy Corbyn, the present Labor Party leader. So this is a very fraught history that I'm talking about. Uh, you might have noticed that I was trying to choose my words carefully because when you make these sorts of criticisms, as I'm sure you know, it's very important to try to be delicate but incisive. Okay. Art, your mic is open. Art, Erlo, your mic is open. Uh, yeah, actually, this is a question from Joelle. Oh, is Joelle there? Hi, Why? Dr. Horn. I sure am. I never miss any of your presentations if I can help it. Oh, my God. Well, Let's check it in the mail. <laughs> Um, I was wondering if you could go back uh, to Phil Foner's book and uh, say a little more about what was the impact of the Bolshevik Revolution uh, on, uh, on U.S. labor and U.S. people. Well, I think in terms of U.S. labor, it has an impact on the rise and organizing of the CIO, the Congress of Industrial Organizations which, as you know, arises approximately 80 years ago, uh, a rise that's generally associated with the rise of the Communist Party in the 1930s as well. What I mean is that prior to the rise of the CIO, you know that there was the American Federation of Labor, which oftentimes focused on organizing craft unions, plumbers, painters, electricians, or for example, they would come into a workplace like this university where I'm now sitting and maybe try to organize the professors and leave the janitors to fend for themselves. Whereas with the rise of the CIO, you saw plant-wide organizing of all grades and levels in a particular workshop or shop and this leads to a spectacular rise, not only in the numbers of union members, but also in the strength of unions. Of course, there was a bit of conflict between the AFL and CIO before they merged in the 1950s. But I would say that the Bolshevik Revolution helps to concretize and materialize the concept of socialism it helps to concretize and materialize the idea that working class people should be a class for themselves, that they should seek to gain more power up to and including gaining the power to rule society. And I would say that that is the historic importance of the impact of the Bolshevik Revolution on the United States of America and indeed worldwide because this process that I'm describing in the US can also be applied to a greater or lesser degree in all of the advanced capitalist countries and even and particularly in what was a largely colonized world. Just a moment. Emil, your mic is open. Emil. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. 
comrade Dr. Horn for this presentation, so excellent, and for everything you do. Loved your latest book on Cuba, which I peddled all over the place. Uh, <laughs> a couple of uh, couple of quick, quick thoughts. First of all, I'm an educator. Uh, I'm in, I'm an anthropologist, but always as much interested in history. And one of the things that strikes me politically is the degree to which it's extremely difficult to get historical understanding of the background of today's issues out to the US public. It's not that people aren't interested, it's the horrible uh, odds we face in terms of what gets published and, and uh, what gets suppressed. And there's just always new things that arise. So one of my issues is how do we, how do we overcome that uh, informational blockade? Another thing also in, in that general line, every time I read something from history from other countries, there's some completely new surprising thing. The latest in the latest edition of the Tribuna Popular, which is the newspaper of the Communist Party of Venezuela, there was a thing about how at the beginning of the 19th century, Simon Bolivar, according to them, sent emissaries to Florida to meet with anti-colonial people in Florida who were this, these uh, escaped slaves with these the Seminoles who I'm not sure because the article is so sure to break off an indep independent South American Republic of Florida. And this was suppressed because President John Adams got together with Mr. De Onis, the Spanish foreign minister, uh, uh, John Quincy Adams actually, and, and, uh, and uh, under the adams Onis Treaty, the United States, States and Spain colluded to prevent Florida from becoming an independent Latin American Republic along with all the other. I don't know if this is even true, but it's the sort of amazing thing that if it is true, we should be getting out to the public and, uh, you know, tremendous obstacles in doing that. I'll stop there and thank you again for all of this. Well, thank you. I, I have to respond to that because I, I know some of the audience might think it's a bit esoteric, but in my book, Negro Comrades of the Crown, I, I, I talk about this because the United States only takes over Florida circa 1821. Uh, before that, there's this raging war involving the indigenous people who fundamentally merge with the Africans, and they're fighting the Spanish, and the United States is very much concerned that the Spanish can't stand up to that indigenous African coalition, so they managed to take over Florida circa 1821. The wars continue. Some of the bloodiest wars the United States was ever involved in are these wars in Florida that stretch from the U.S. takeover up until 1855 when the Seminole African alliance is defeated and there, many of them are deported en masse to Mexico where their descendants continue to reside. But you can find some substantiation of those points in my book, Negro Comrades of the Crown. Now, to, to your previous question, the only practical suggestion I would make is that folks try to organize letter writing campaigns to the local newspapers. I mean, the, the newspaper industry is, is in deep trouble in this country, as you probably know. I mean, there's no guarantee the New York Times will even survive uh, this century or perhaps even this decade. And so, I mean, believe it or not, I had a letter in the Wall Street Journal just last week, for example. I mean, it wasn't a political letter, but it was a letter nonetheless. So I would really suggest that there be concerted efforts to send letters to the editor and op-ed pieces to break this paper curtain, this blockade on sound ideas. The other thing I would suggest, and this is something I've had a fair amount of success with, is to invite C-SPAN to cover your events. Matter of fact, we should have had C-SPAN cover that event in St. Louis. You'd be surprised, I mean, at what they'll cover. Maybe you won't if you've watched that station, because a lot of that stuff is very boring. And so I'm sure that they would be very much interested in covering many of the events we come up with. And um, so I don't know. Those are my only two suggestions about breaking the information blockade. Kenneth? 
Kenneth Heard, your mic is open. You have to unmute yourself now. Kenneth, there you go. You just muted yourself again. <laughs> there you go. Yes, this, uh, greetings. <laughs> The technology is amazing, I must admit. Um, here at the National Writers Union, we'd like to thank Dr. Horn for his astute presentation uh, June the 16th at the Paul Robeson House. One of the things that he posed, and we need to see about further data on this, was the ways that we must approach this Trump administration. Dr. Horn, things have changed just a slight bit. In terms of African Americans, moving towards fighting Mr. Trump's present operations. There is a conservative African-American section. It's noted also in the national report, I believe that was on the national question some years ago from the party that had been able to defeat McKinney and her race along with another person and his race. What types of things can we move at this point in time to cease the ability of that conservative wing with the history that we know from you to push those folk back? Well, I mean, I, I agree that this trend exists. You need to look no further than Clarence Thomas on the U.S. Supreme Court. But obviously, if you look at the totals on the 2016 election with, you know, black women voting against Trump, 95 to 5, black men 88 to 12, it's difficult to say that their influence is growing. And in fact, I think in light of this latest crisis that Trump has ignited with these millionaire professional athletes in basketball and football, that he's going to lose even more altitude. I mean, even people who gave him a million dollars for his uh, inauguration are turning against him. I'm speaking of the owner of the New England Patriots football team, the owner of the Jacksonville Jaguars, who you might have noticed in the Jacksonville Ravens game today, linked arms with his black American players when the national anthem was being played in, in London. So, I mean, I don't want to downplay the strength of conservatism, but I, I do think that they don't have that much purchase quite frankly, in the black community. I mean, I mean, for example, look, look at the New York Amsterdam News, the black newspaper in, 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 in Harlem. Armstrong Williams, who was a comrade of uh, Uncle Ben, the HUD secretary. What's his name? Ben, the, the surgeon. Uh, you know. Ben Carson. Uh, ben Carson. So Armstrong writes this column for the Amsterdam News every week. And so you would think, and he's a conservative, so you would think, oh, my God, he has a foot on but he pays them to put his column in the, in the newspaper. So now, of course, that that's you know he gets to circulate his ideas. But then, on the other hand, I mean, usually you get paid to write. You don't pay people to publish your stuff. So I hope that responds to your question. Brad, your mic is open is open. You have to now unmute yourself. Brad Doty, is it? Doughty? There you are. Yeah, I'm sorry, guys. I'm, this is just a quick question. I was late to this, and I was running, and I was going to be back in time, and then I just got completely absent-minded. But my question to you, Doctor, is what was your book titled again? And I apologize for joining this late today. Which book? Which, you mean the book we're discussing? Yes, yes. Oh, it's uh, The Bolshevik Revolution, Its Impact on American Radicals, Liberals, and Labor, a documentary study edited by Philip S. Foner. I wrote the new edition just published by international uh, publishers in New York City. Okay, I really appreciate that. Um, again, I apologize for uh, being late, but you were very well spoken, and I really appreciate your time and your information tonight. Well, thank you. No problem. Cameron, your mic is open. Hello? Oh, sure. Uh, yes, uh, thanks for the discussion, um, Ms. Cameron. I was wondering what opportunities do you see for building an international perspective in anti-racist and other progressive struggles today? Oh, I think, I think that there are all sorts of opportunities available. I mean, 
to its credit, the Black Lives Matter movement and the anti-police terror movement uh, have visited the Human Rights Council in Geneva, for example. Uh, activists in Chicago uh, entertained a visiting delegation from the United Nations, which, by the way, then made a report endorsing the question of reparations to the descendants of enslaved Africans. I think that other opportunities need to be pursued. I mean, for example, the Organization of American States is headquartered in Washington, D.C. Uh, there are a number of countries in this hemisphere who I think have a bone to pick with Uncle Sam, who would be more than willing to entertain our delegations. I would say the same holds true for Beijing and Havana. I would even say the same holds true for Brussels, for that matter in light of this uh, ham-fisted effort by Mr. Trump to isolate Germany and split the European Union by making overtures to France. Uh, obviously, I should mention the African Union headquartered in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. And it's interesting, uh, going back to the founding of its predecessor, the Organization of African Unity, there were dozens of black Americans present at the founding in 1963 as police dogs were attacking black youth in Birmingham, and of course those black Americans helped to lobby <coughs> that organization to make statements castigating U.S. imperialism, which then of course were acted upon by President Kennedy. So I think the opportunities are available. The question is acting upon these opportunities, and I may perhaps even having the gumption to pursue these opportunities because you well know that U.S. imperialism takes very seriously this idea of people carrying favor with real and imagined antagonists of U.S. imperialism. <clears throat> Gary, did you have another question? Gary, your mic is open. Yeah, um, okay, yeah, you know, the book mainly was about the reaction of people in the U.S. to the Bolshevik Revolution and kind of contradicted the drive of the powers that be to kind of isolate it and was in that vein. Um, you, in your introduction, kind of opened up the broader perspective of saying how the Haitian Revolution and this Bolshevik Revolution were related. Now, I think going forward today, how do we see that that thing that happened 100 years ago, and as you pointed out, was you know very closely related to something that happened 100 years before that, is now relevant to what's happening today, and. You know, specifically, I see the way, and of course, you know, the idiot on the top has a lot to do with it, but I see how this movement of the NFL players against the, the certain ritual is, you know, kind of like opening up things and opening up things to a larger perspective. And I said, how can we see that that not only, you know, relates to that thing from 1917, but make people to understand that, you know, this is part of the same thing, and it's not something that just happened, you know, today because of this idiot. Well, if I understand the question, I think that we understand that this Bolshevik Revolution and the Soviet Union was in existence from 1917 to 1991, which obviously means it's an event of history, and we need to understand the impact of that historic event to reiterate on the collapse of colonialism, on the erosion of Jim Crow, on the erosion of white supremacy and racism, and also how with that collapse things have been made more difficult not only for people in the formerly colonized world, but as noted even for social democrats as the German elections today suggested. Now on your, what I perceive as your separate question with regard to this current controversy with regard to Trump and professional athletes, I think it's a very revealing episode because basically what he's telling these black American athletes is that you are affluent 
and therefore you should not care about what happens to Michael Brown and Ferguson and Laquan McDonald in Chicago. That's not your concern. But obviously, to put it on a theoretical basis, uh, Mr. Trump obviously has misunderstood the question of black liberation because, as any professional football player could tell him, as Michael Bennett of the Seattle Seahawks tried to say just a few days ago, that just because you have a six-figure or seven-figure paycheck doesn't mean you, you can escape police terror. I mean, so these players are acting in their material self-interest by opposing police brutality, but obviously this dotard, to coin a term, uh, does not realize this. Um, Gerald, you invited me earlier to say something. I'd like to chime in now. Gary and I have an ongoing uh, struggle as it relates to this uh, issue uh, of the athletes and, uh, and whether or not they are displaying uh, disrespect uh, to uh, the symbol of the flag and the country and whether or not it's a mass movement. And I would, I would say that uh, under no circumstances, as they have said themselves, are they disrespecting the flag or are they disrespecting the country? That's not what they're doing. What they're doing is using the uh, kneeling and the fist in the air as a cry out for the country to become what it says it is and for the and for democracy to really extend to uh everyone who is uh who should be uh 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 seen as citizens uh, uh and provided the rights of citizens which african americans uh have been denied so um i think we make a grave error if we see this protest as a sign of disrespect, it is, and they've said themselves, it's not disrespect. It is a sign, it is a cry out for equality and for justice. And to refer to it as a sign of disrespect is uh, insult to injury, is to add insult to injury. Anyway. So Gary and I will continue in this struggle, I'm sure. Excellent. All right, so we're a little over the hour. Um, Gerald, if you, and Tony, if you have any closing remarks. Well, just briefly, with regard to that last point, you know, you know that the third stanza of the national anthem specifically and pointedly attacks black people for, for aligning with the real and imagined antagonists of the United States of America. So when black people in 2017 decide not to stand for the national anthem, I, I think that there is sound reason. As a matter of fact, anybody who opposes uh, attacking a segment of your citizenry probably should not stand for the national anthem as well. So uh, I think that's the, the deeper understanding we, we should strive for. But in any case, once again, I think that the Bolshevik Revolution was a world historic event. It transformed the world. And I think that it also should impart a basic lesson of history. That is to say that oftentimes there's a kind of victor's history. That is to say, if you win, that must mean you did something right. And if you're defeated, that must mean you did it, you were wrong. And sometimes you can win and exist for two centuries or more and pursuing a fundamentally flawed project, and sometimes you can pursue a project that uplifts humanity and be defeated. And that's the final point that I would make. I think the only thing that I would add to that is uh, uh, with that comes also the question of power. With that comes the question of how do trade unionists and working class leaders and African American activists and uh, all of our allies build the type of institutional power that continues to challenge capitalism and racism. And, and with that, I want to thank Dr. Gerald Horn uh, once again for uh, spending his time with us and bringing this discussion uh, to our participants. Um, 
and, and look forward to future discussions with you, uh, uh, Dr. Gerald Horn. Thank you again. Thank you for inviting me, and good night. Okay, thank you, everyone. Good night.